James chapter 2, verses 1 through 26. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Thank you, ladies, for reading the word for us. So we, in this series, are obviously studying the book of James, and we're reading the scripture before we uh, preach on it, before we talk about it, because James was a letter, and it was sent to the church by the brother of Jesus. And it would have been read aloud to the church and then they would have talked about it. And so that's what we're doing in this series. And uh, in this series, what we're gonna talk about, what I'd like to do is dig into all of chapter two. It's a big chunk of scripture. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab that. Uh, We're gonna spend the majority of the time in the first half of chapter two, but I wanna start with the last verse, what Courtney just read. And I want these words to just kind of settle on us for a minute. Here's what he says. Faith without deeds is dead. Faith without deeds is dead. It's kind of a theme verse uh, of this whole chapter. And what he's trying to help us understand is that there's a connection between uh, the faith we profess and then the actual way we live our lives. Like He's not saying you have to earn your salvation, but if you're really saved, it should be seen in the way you you act, in the way you behave. Like there There should be a connection between these two. And he says, just because you believe in God doesn't mean that you actually care about God or love God. He says, even the, the demons believe there's one God and shudder. And so he's saying, you know, in our world, and we know this, there's a lot of people who say, yeah, no, I believe in God. I believe there's a God, but that doesn't mean that that person loves God or cares about God or is a follower of Jesus. And so what James is trying to say is, we need to look at the way we live our lives. That will reveal the faith that we actually have. And this whole book is about active faith. So it's called a faith that works. And so this is what it looks like to live as a Christian. This is what a Christian life looks like when it's lived. And what he does to make this point in the second half of chapter two is he gives us two examples. 
Uh, two very clear uh, people from the Old Testament. They kind of contrast each other. Uh, one's kind of a big deal, one's not. And, and so he's trying to make a point between these two examples that goes back to what he said at the beginning of chapter two. And I'll explain that connection in just a minute. But let's look at these examples for a minute. First person is kind of a big deal in the Bible, right? He's, he's like, he's one of the heroes of faith. And most of us have probably heard of this guy, right? If you've been in Sunday school, maybe, you, maybe you've sang songs about him. It goes like this. Father Abraham had many sons, right? Know this one? Father, uh, many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, kick it in. You know, you ever play this one? <laughs> a lot of fun, right? So we sing songs about Abraham. He's kind of a big deal in, in the faith. And so uh, what God said to Abraham is he, he chose him as a special person. He said, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to make all your descendants as numerous as the stars. He made him a very rich and wealthy man. And he said, the whole world is going to be blessed through you. And that blessing was Jesus Christ. Christ, his lineage goes through Abraham. Every Jewish person comes from the lineage of, of Abraham. And so Abraham's one of the most famous and important people ever to live. And the story goes that Abraham was a man of faith. James is saying this is true, and you can see it by how he lived. And so the story is one of the more wild stories in the Bible. Is he has a son at the age of 110, and you go, how's that possible? But it happened. And then this, this guy, uh, this, this son that he has, God says, I, I'd like you to sacrifice your son, which is an insane request. But Abraham says, oh, okay, if that's what you say, Lord. And he binds his son, not as a baby, but as kind of a, a, a this is like a preteen, takes him to the top of a mountain, and he's a, he has a knife up in the air, about to sacrifice his son, and God says, an angel says, wait, and he provides a ram and stops the whole thing. So that's an example of radical obedience, where, where God says, and James makes the claim that his, his actions revealed a genuine faith, and could probably stop there and go, all right, we get it, right? Your actions and the big and the little things must be seen through your uh, actions. But he doesn't stop there, he gives another example a less glamorous example, which I'm glad he does. Uh, so we know about Abraham. He's kind of a big deal. But what do we know about Rahab the prostitute? How many, how many Bible stories have you sung about Rahab the prostitute, right? Not a lot, I'm guessing. Um, so I, I love that she's in this story because you've got this patriarch of the faith and then you've got this nobody many of us may have never heard of. And so Rahab was kind of like, she wasn't, she wasn't special. She wasn't one of the like upper crust of her culture, in fact, she was probably an outcast. She was probably so poor she couldn't hide it. And if Rahab rolled up into Christ's rock and sat down in the front row, we'd probably be like, ooh, ooh, make us uncomfortable a little bit. But Rahab didn't make God uncomfortable. God, God had a deep love for Rahab, and Rahab loved the Lord. And it's seen in her actions, and so uh, the story goes that uh, she, there were two spies that came into Jericho. She lived in Jericho, was about to be taken out by the Israelites. The whole story of God kind of had to flow through Jericho because they were going to about to enter the promised land. And she knew these spies were of God. They were representing the one true God. And so the king finds out they're there. She hides them, helps them escape, and her actions are deemed to her as righteous. So her actions prove that her faith is real. And what's cool about Rahab is you have, in the beginning of Matthew, you have a genealogy. And you go, well, what's that there for, Right? But it begins with Abraham, but the 10th person in is Rahab the prostitute. And so in the lineage of our Lord and Savior is both these great people and these outcasts. I love that about God. And so what he, wants to, what he wants us to learn through these examples, there's two main things that he wants us to understand. This whole second half of, of, of James 2, to understand this one thing. First, faith without works is dead. Right? And the big things and the little things, we should actually see that our faith is real through the way we live our lives, through the way that we actually behave. But the other thing he wants us to understand very clearly is that our God does not play favorites. He doesn't do it. And so the, the faith of Abraham was just as meaningful to God as the faith of Rahab. He doesn't, he doesn't judge our faith by things on external, things like uh, our nationality, color of our skin, our, our socioeconomic status, or even our sexual history, our sin history. He just looks at the heart and says, I'll just deem anybody who gives faith to me as this, it puts that all on the same level. And so he doesn't play favorites. And since God doesn't play favorites, James is making the argument that neither should we. It has no place in the church. So if that's how our God treats us, then, then we should do the same. And so if we go back to James chapter 1, that's what this whole chapter is about. And so I want to talk today about when he talks about faith in action, the action 
that he wants us to understand. There's a what and a why and a better way. And he's going to talk about favoritism. And here's what he has to say. The what, the thing that we should not do as believers. He writes in verse 1, he says, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, he's talking to the church, must not show favoritism. Must not do it. And so he just lays it out there very clear and says, that kind of behavior ought not to be among my people. And so the the Greek word here is literally translated respecter of persons. He says, we should not, we don't elevate people up, we don't put them down low. When they walk into our fellowship or when we encounter them in the world, we treat everybody the same. Right, so favoritism has no place in the church. And he goes on to give an example. And the example goes like this, verse two. Suppose a man comes into your meeting or into our church like today, right? Wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, hey, have a good seat. I have a good seat for you. But you say to the poor man, you stand over there or, or sit on the floor at my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Right, so the text gives a name to playing favorites. It calls it discrimination. That's what he says it is. And we hear a lot about discrimination in our world right now. I know we all hear that word because it's deplorable, right? It's not, it's not okay. And we live in a time when we're, that's, discrimination is called out all the time. There's no tolerance for it, and yet we'd all agree that it's a bad thing. Here's how we define discrimination, dictionary definition, kind of the way we understand it in our culture, all right? Discrimination is the unjust or prejudicial treatment of different categories of people or things, especially on the grounds of race, age, or sex. That's that's what discrimination is. And in America right now, you would have everybody agree that is absolutely wrong, right? We've had the Me Too movement. We lash out against that kind of sexual discrimination. What happened with George Floyd? We go, no, this cannot. Racism is not acceptable. Ageism, all of it. We go, no. In America, like high intolerance for that. And yet, this is not a new cultural idea. This is a deeply biblical idea. And what James is saying is it has no place in the church. We do not discriminate. We do not play favorites among the people of God. We don't treat people differently based on external things. So we don't look at somebody and go, well, you're of a certain age, or your race, or your skin color, nationality, uh, socioeconomic status, uh, none of it. Even based on attractiveness. We don't treat people differently based on anything external. Everybody gets treated the same inside the church. And I think we'd all agree that discrimination is wrong and we shouldn't do it. But in practice, in our behavior, well, it's easier said than done, isn't it? Because if we're honest, we like to be around people like us. We like to be around people who make us feel comfortable, who don't threaten us. uh, And we we kind of like to avoid people who are different than us. They make us feel a little uneasy, or they might even remind us of people who have hurt us in the past. And so we do this in some big and some subtle and not so subtle ways. Right? So I, we might uh, avoid a neighbor who is of a different race because they just make us uncomfortable and we don't know how to interact with them. We might try to sit by the cool kids at school because they, we don't want to be associated with the kids who aren't cool, so we just try to hang out with them so some of their coolness can rub off on us and we might do that at work too and so we play those games there. Uh, we might want to hire people who are younger than older. We might like working with people who are men and not women and so we do all these different little things to kind of discriminate each other. And we don't realize it's that. We don't call it that, but that's what it is. I, I've got this, this friend who who talks about the discrimination he feels on airplanes. This is a subtle little thing, but he's a bigger fella. He's tall and he's bigger. And he says, when I walk onto an airplane, I feel discriminated against. So anybody on the airplane who's got a seat open next to them, if I'm rolling in late, I can just see their eyes get all big like this. <laughs> you know, and I could see them like subtle prayers, like, please don't sit next to me, please. And when he sits down, they're like, ugh, right? And he's joking when he tells me this, right? But underneath it all is a, just a certain kind of pain. And there's a pain in his voice around this because he just, he feels treated differently in our culture because of his size. Little ways we do this. What have you experienced? What, what kind of discrimination have you observed or even felt in this world? Little stuff, right? I, I was a table waiter for eight years at the old TGI Fridays by the mall there. I've mentioned this before, but I learned a lot as a table waiter. A lot of my stories come from that. And there was this guy that worked at this particular TGI Fridays, and he had been there a while, so he kind of did whatever he wanted to. And 
he would go up and play host for himself and he'd stand at the front and he'd just watch everybody kind of come in. And if he saw a couple, you know, well-dressed on date night, he'd go open the door for them be like, hey, how you doing? Come with me. And he'd go and he'd seat him in his section. He'd be all nice, take good care of him. But he, if he was up there and he saw like, a, I don't know, a single mom roll up in a junky old car and a bunch of kids pile out, he'd be like, why don't you put them over in so-and-so section? Like, I don't want to wait on them. And then he'd go, he, he, he only wanted to kind of wait on the rich and he didn't want to wait on the poor or associate with them. He profiled every single person who came inside of that restaurant. Every one of them. Watched him do this. All right, he's, he's actually living out the, ex, the example that James has kind of given us here uh, in this text. And so what James is saying is this kind of behavior, so subtle or not so subtle, has no place among God's people. It has no place here. It, it must be uh, given, uh, given away. It must, we must rid it from our lives. And so then that's the what. Don't discriminate. Don't do it. Now he tells us the why. And the why is always harder than the what. Like we can probably all assume a why, but James has a very specific reason for Christians. And so here's the why. Here's why we don't discriminate. He says, listen, my dear brothers and sisters. That's a term of affection. He says, please listen to me here. Right. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. So the reason discrimination or, or favoritism, when we show that, the reason it's wrong is that we dishonor God, we dishonor the poor, and we reveal that we might not even understand the gospel. It's that big of a deal because God, God has a special place in his heart for the poor. Right? He, he, James is quoting his brother here on the Sermon on the Mount. The first thing Jesus says, he says, hey, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And Luke, he just says, blessed are the poor. And so God has a special place in his heart. He has compassion for the poor. The poor in spirit and the physically poor are special to God. I mean, they matter to him. And so the physically poor are those who just don't have the same advantages that most of us do. They don't have the resources. They they struggle. And God says, I love them. I I am close to those poor. And the poor in spirit, those are the people that just kind of come to the end of their rope and go, I I don't know what to do. Lord, I don't know where to go. I need a savior. I've I've hurt people. I just need, I need your forgiveness. I need you, God, right? Like that, that's the poor in spirit. In fact, the kingdom of heaven is only filled with those who are poor in spirit. Those of us who come to God and go, look, I need you, Father. I need a savior, but that's how it works in the kingdom. You have to become poor in spirit in order to be a part of it. It's just not how it works in the real world. It's not what we're taught. When I was a kid, we didn't have the kind of organized sports that we have now. Right? There wasn't all these club teams and traveling teams and all this kind of business. Right? There was, uh, sports were a little more organic. Like people, kids didn't get up at 3 in the morning and go work out at school so they're ready for the season. Like it was a little more laid back. If we wanted to play team sports, we had to call our buddies and kind of make it happen. Right? You guys might remember this. And then so if we were playing basketball, like 10, 15 guys would show up at the court and, and we'd make it happen. And so the way it would work is we'd pick the two best athletes. They'd pick teams. Right? And the best athletes, their goal was I want to pick a team that's going to dominate. I want to pick a team that's going to win. And so, you know, they'd start and they look at the look at everybody gathered and they go, well, I'll take you. You're a good athlete, right? So the best athletes start getting drafted. And if you're if you ever done this and you're not one of those best athletes, it just gets more and more humiliating. You're like, okay, not that person. And you know, if it goes on long enough, it really gets humiliating. I I try to play, you know, with the big kids at, from time to time. And, and I remember it kind of be like me and that kid with a broken leg, and they'd be like, all right, Joel, come on. We'll tag you, right? But the goal, of their, their goal is that's what they do, right? You want to pick the best team. You want to pick winners. You want to pick the cream of the crop. Get them on your team so that your team can dominate, all right? That's how it works in the world. But listen to me closely, okay? That's anti-gospel. That kind of thinking is anti-gospel. It's not how God works, okay? God doesn't go looking for the best and the brightest, all right? If, if he did, if the kingdom of God was full of the best and the brightest, we probably wouldn't make the cut. I mean, I'm going to pick on you, church, but look around the room here. That's just not who we are, all right? Like, I mean, look around. Like, we're not the cream of the crop, all right? We're not the best of the best. Like, we're a ragtag group of sinners saved by grace. We've all had to come to God and go, look, I'm at the end of my rope. I need some help. That's who we are, all right? Now, if you're out there going, no, I don't know about that. I, I kind of mm, hear what you're saying, pastor, but... I don't know, I look around the room and think I'm probably top 10%, right? I mean, 
I'm doing great. So, uh, you know, well, let me talk to you, Mr. 10 percenter. What makes you think you're so great? Right? Like, if you think you should be on Team Jesus, you're probably not on Team Jesus. It's not how it works, right? Like, if you think you're so awesome, Christ probably says, you know, you don't need me. You're doing great by yourself. See, the only people on Team Jesus are the people who know they don't belong on Team Jesus. All right? We're all a bunch of sinners saved by grace. We've been extended mercy. All right? We, we know the, that we don't belong on the team. You see, the way Jesus picks his team is a little different than, than we do. He kind of looks past the awesome people who think they have it together, kind of like that waiter I mentioned. You know, they, they got things under control. They're good. They figured it out. And he goes, not that they're not welcome. They just don't need Jesus. Instead, he looks for the humble, repentant, broken people who go, hey, I need a savior. All right. See, the only awesome person on team Jesus is Jesus. All right. He does not need us on his team. And, and spoiler alert, team Jesus wins in the end. Good team to be on. But he doesn't need us on it. We're only on his team because by his grace and in his mercy, he has extended that grace and mercy to us. We're only on the team because he led us on the team. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And that's also why it's so wrong to discriminate. Because if we've been shown mercy, if if we've been shown this unbelievable grace, what right do any of us have to look down on anybody else? I mean, what right do we have? We've had to admit our own poverty, our own need for God. So what right do we have? See, the reason that this is wrong, if we've been forgiven this huge debt of sin and we think somehow we cannot show mercy to other people, when we discriminate, we, when we show favoritism, we reveal that we are either shamefully ungrateful or we really don't understand the gospel in the first place. If we treat people as less than, we don't extend mercy, we just don't, we, you might not get it. Jesus has a parable that makes this point really clear. It's called The Unmerciful Servant. It's from Matthew 18, and I'm just going to paraphrase it so you kind of understand the point. He really wants us to kind of feel this. And so the way this story goes is there's a king who calls his servants to account. He wants to collect on the debts that have come in and that, that are owed to him. And so he calls the person who owes him the most money in. This guy owes him 10,000 talents of silver, or of gold. And just to give you an idea of scale, uh, uh, one talent of gold would be like 20 years wages, a huge sum of money. It was 10,000. So that number, you know, in modern times would be something like $12 billion. It's a number like nobody could pay. Right? Back then, Jeff Bezos didn't exist. So he could just give some Amazon stocks, say we're good here, right? But not, didn't exist back then, right? The idea is you couldn't pay this amount of money back. And so this servant comes before the king and just says, will, will you please just let me try, okay? I'll, I'll work the rest of my life to do this. Just let me try. I'll give you my best. Just don't throw me in jail. And the king looks down and goes, knows this guy. He could try his whole life. It'll never happen. So the king has mercy on him and he forgives the whole debt, wipes it clean. The king takes a $12 billion loss to have mercy on one single servant. Can you imagine the mercy of that king, what that's meant to reveal about the king? And can you imagine the joy of that servant to be like, oh, I'm free of that debt. I don't have that hanging over me. He must have ran out of that building going, hallelujah, I'm free. Like, I don't have to carry that burden anymore. The joy that he should feel is what we're meant to kind of think about when we are forgiven the debt of sin that God has forgiven from us. And so you'd think that that servant goes off, take, I mean, he's just the nicest, most merciful guy, right? That's not what he does. And so he goes out, he finds somebody who owes him something like lunch money, like $20. And he says, give me my money. Give me my money, buddy. And he starts choking him. And the servant, this, this guy that owes him a little bit of money, says, please have mercy on me. Don't, don't, don't throw me in jail. And the guy says, no, jail with you, buddy. And he throws him in jail uh, until he could pay every penny back. King hears about it, says, get that wicked servant into here. And here's what he says to the servant. He says, you wicked servant. I canceled your debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant because I have mercy on you? And then the king had the man thrown in jail and tortured till he could pay every penny back. When we show favoritism or discriminate, when we've been forgiven a huge debt, we spit in the face of God's grace. I mean, we say to him, I... If we, if we treat people without mercy, we say to God's grace, I just don't think it's that great. The reason it's wrong 
all right, to show discrimination, to show favoritism, is that we, re- we dishonor God, we dishonor the poor, and we, we reveal either we are un- shamefully ungrateful or we don't understand the gospel in the first place. That's the why behind why not discriminate. And so there's the what, don't do it. That's the why now. James wants to say, but there's a better way. He says, church, there's a better way. Here's what he has to say about the better way. Starting in verse 8 and 9, he says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. That's the way to do it. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. And so he calls it what it is. It's sin, but if you, if you do this, this other thing, all right, love your neighbor as yourself, you do right. That's the better way. And so that, this is really, it's the greatest commandment, right? Love God. This is Jesus again. He's quoting his brother. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It's also called the golden rule. Do unto others as you've had done unto you. He, Jesus is a genius. James just quoting him. So let's talk about this for a minute. How do you like to be treated? What, what's, what's it feel like to be discriminated against? Because you know. We've all felt it, right? We've all experienced discrimination at some level. Does that ever feel good? Of course it doesn't. So let me just ask you, what's been your experience with discrimination? Favoritism. What have you felt? What's been leveled against you? You ever been excluded from the the cool kids because you just, you don't make the cut? You ever been treated unfairly because of your gender? You ever been talked down to by somebody who just thinks they're so awesome and you just got to listen to that person and they just talk down to you? You ever been judged by an unfair stereotype? Your, your parents or grandparents ever play favorites in your family? They ever do that to you? That last one? That one's so painful. And a lot of you have experienced favoritism in the family. Pastor Bill used to talk about the evils of this. I've experienced all of these things and they all are painful and they are all they all create wounds. And I realize I'm not the easiest guy in the world to discriminate against. Right? Some of you in here, I know you're, you're carrying some serious wounds. You've been hurt. You've been, you've, been, and you've been treated like an outcast. People have shown favorites to other people and not you. What are your wounds? What are you carrying? I just want to say it's okay to name those wounds. It's okay to feel that pain. It's just not okay to perpetuate it. Right? Discrimination, he calls it a sin. Favoritism is a sin. It's wrong. And so we're supposed to treat others as we want to be treated, not treat others as we have been treated. And so the vision James is casting here, he's saying, in the church, we are to end the cycle of discrimination. It should stop with us. Of anybody in the world, when somebody comes around us who have been forgiven so much, we should end this cycle of, there should be no discrimination in the church. That shouldn't exist here. And yet it's, it's as at play today as it was in James' day. It might even be worse right now. I see it all the time in the body of believers. In COVID and this political season, that kicked it up and I saw some really ugly things and I'm still seeing some ugly things. So James comes with, and he comes with his most practical piece of uh, advice here and then he comes with a warning. And so here's what he says to end this section. He says, uh, speak and act as those who are gonna be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. That's the the warning. And then he says, mercy triumphs over judgment. It's the word of the Lord. And so again, the theme of James is faith without works is dead. And we're to be doers of the word, not just uh, hearers of the word. And so he says to us, his most poignant statement, he says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. So what is the law that gives freedom? It's grace and it's mercy. That's how we've been treated, right? God, he he saw our sin. He saw the debt that we created. He didn't just go, "Eh, I don't care. No, he dealt with it. He sent his own son who became sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, right? So he forgave our sin. He, He bled out on a cross so that our sin might be forgiven. And so you can come to him with any sin. It doesn't matter your past or who you are, and the blood of Christ can cover your sin. He'll forgive that debt. You don't need to carry it anymore. But it cost him his son. He showed us this incredible mercy, and he says, I want you to share that same mercy with others. Discrimination is the opposite of mercy. It is judgment. Again, the core message of James is that faith without mercy is dead. And so what he's really saying here is faith without mercy toward others isn't genuine faith. 
I wrestle with that a minute. Faith without mercy toward others isn't genuine faith. So what he's saying is you, you, can have, you can have faith in Jesus if you trust in his mercy and yet refuse to extend that mercy to certain other people. You might not understand the gospel. It may not have penetrated your heart. And so you need to search your heart. You need to look inside. And if you look inside your soul and you find a disdain for an individual or a group of individuals based on some external thing like age or race or gender, all right, you need to bring that to God and you need to deal with that and ask for healing. These are the evil thoughts that James is talking about. I'm not saying you have to be perfect in this area, but you need to name your prejudices and your biases and bring those to the Lord. And if for some reason you have those and you're actively living that out in some discriminatory way, you really need to question your faith because these things are incompatible. And if either of these things are true of you, you have discriminatory thoughts or prejudicial thoughts or acted out and you call yourself a Christian, you have become the wicked servant. That's who you've become. And you reveal something about yourself. And James has a strong warning, and so does Jesus, for those who are the wicked servant. He says, judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Now, these words should cause us to pause, even scare us a little bit. Because what he's saying is, if, if, you, if you judge anyone in a way that doesn't reveal the mercy I've shown you, that same judgment will be shown to you. Okay, that doesn't mean that if you uh, have discriminatory actions and thoughts and you do that over and over without any kind of re repentance whatsoever that you lose your salvation, it probably means you just weren't saved in the first place. You did not understand the gospel. And this is what James is saying when faith without works is dead. He's just saying a person of genuine faith will always extend mercy to another person. And when we fail to do that, and we will, we're going to mess this up, Okay, we are going to discriminate at times. We're not going to be perfect as a church. We all know that that's true, right? We're going to screw that up. We're going to show favoritism. We might even have whole seasons of doing this. The difference between a non-Christian and a Christian or a follower of Jesus and somebody who's not is that the Holy Spirit will never leave you in that heart condition, all right? You, he will bring it to you and you will repent of that. If somebody confronts you and says, you have hurt me, you have discriminated against me, you will repent and ask for forgiveness. And he will always bring us to a place, right, church, where we remember that we are a sinner saved by grace and it's only by his grace that we are saved. He'll always bring us there. And so I wanna, I wanna end with a question. I'd like you to wrestle with this now and as you go into the week. Is there any acts of discrimination or thoughts of prejudice that you have alive in your life right now? Okay, and we're gonna sing this last song. Now, it's a song about the goodness of God's grace and our total need for it. And as we sing it, I just want you to ask, just go, Lord, I might not see it, but is there anything in my life? Is there anything from my past that I've just kind of got a name? Is there a group of people I, that I, you know I just don't treat fairly? Is there somebody I haven't treated fairly? And if he shows you something, confess it and ask for forgiveness. Let me, let me start this time of confession with one of my own. Okay, you remember that table waiter I mentioned earlier? That, that guy who profiled everybody. Right, that, that wasn't some guy I saw, that was me. And that's how I, 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 I did that for a while. See, what happened with me as a table waiter, I... Uh, I got treated poorly enough times, I got stiffed by enough people that I started, this resentment started to build up in my heart. I mean, this is how this kind of works. And I started to put people in categories of good tipper and bad tipper. And it was based entirely on external things. So I just, I'd watch people come in the door and I go, all right, they're dressed a certain way, uh-uh. Gender, age, shamefully, I mean, I, race would even play a role in that. I don't want to admit that about myself, but it's true. And I worked there a long time and odds are, I've served, I've served thousands of people over the years. Odds are, I have shown discrimination to you. Okay, I've, I've shown favoritism to you, someone you love, someone you know, or somebody within your circle of people. I have dishonored people made in the image of God in the way that I acted as a table waiter. And, and I just, I'm ashamed of myself, and I just want to say that I am sorry, and I feel sorry for it. And I want to invite any of you if I ever treated you with some form of discrimination in the past, if you felt favoritism for me as a waiter, because I've waited on plenty of you in here, I'm sure, 
Now, please bring that to me. If it was as a waiter or any other time, but bring that to me. If you ever feel something like that from me as your pastor, as one of your pastors, bring that to me so that I, I, can, I can ask your forgiveness for it. Because that's, that, that stuff has no business being in the church. And, and I, I am just, a, I'm, I'm ashamed of how I acted in the past. And so uh, you might have things like that from your past. And so as we sing this last song, it's a song we all know. It's called Amazing Grace. Yes, you do. And I want to sing it. And I want us to sing it because we celebrate God's grace and in the same breath we admit that we're a wretch. It's an admission of who we really are. And a wretch is an old English word for a banished person. Okay, it's somebody who's an outcast. It's a contemptible, miserable person like Rahab the prostitute and Joel the arrogant waiter. All right, we can admit that we're a wretch, okay? And the idea is like, we can just say, we have no business being on Team Jesus, right? We, we need God's grace. And so let's sing it proudly. Let's celebrate his grace as we sing this song, but let's also just remember who we are and that we all come to, come to Jesus in the same place today in this room, a wretch in need of God's grace. And as we sing this and celebrate the goodness of God's grace, ask him to show anywhere in your life that you have withheld mercy from somebody, that you have discriminated against somebody, and just ask his forgiveness. Say, Lord, help me see it and free me from it because the Holy Spirit wants to get that stuff out of your life so that you are free to love well. So let's sing this song. Let's proclaim it boldly and let's be open to what the spirit wants to say and then i'll come close this but let's praise our lord